Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Ernie Sandlin, Director of Marketing for University Village Thousand Oaks, a life plan community here in Ventura County. We're pleased to have you join us today to learn about your retirement lifestyle options from Brad Breeding, President and Co-Founder of MyLifeSite.net. As a life plan community, University Village offers residential living with convenient access to our adjacent health center for assisted living, memory support, and long-term care in a nursing center if ever needed. We offer an incredible variety of on-site amenities and activities. These include a beautiful 65-acre campus adjacent to a top liberal arts university, tennis and pickleball, a fitness center, swimming pool and jacuzzi, Catalina Hall for movies, guest lectures, and musical performances, and multiple dining venues with chef-prepared meals. Our culture embraces individuality, and residents are drawn to fun. We want our residents to enjoy today to the max and make their uh, tomorrow even better. Mr. Breeding is here to offer unbiased information about senior living. He spent 14 years as a personal financial advisor, focusing on sound planning for retirees. In addition to speaking at events, such as the one we're hosting today, he also offers tools and resources on mylifesite.net to, to help families research all senior living options, including life plan communities like University Village. Mr. Breeding is a nationally recognized speaker on retirement planning and the senior living industry, and is the author of the book, What's the Deal with Retirement Communities? Today, he'll talk about evaluating your financial plans in today's economy, the role housing plays, in retirement planning, and how the senior living industry and residents are responding to the coronavirus. Following today's webinar, we'll answer questions you may have. We also invite you to schedule a virtual appointment to see for yourself what University Village can offer you. We're confident you'll be impressed by what you see. At this time, I'll hand things over to Mr. Brad Breeding. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ernie. I really appreciate the invitation to present um, on behalf of University Village Thousand Oaks and Welcome to those of you that have joined us on the call today. It's a delight to be with all of you. So as you can see by the topic or the title here, planning your future in an uncertain environment. If there's one thing that I think we can certainly all agree on is that this is a very uncertain time. So I want to just share a little bit with you today about how, how we can kind of stay focused on the most important parts of planning during a time like this. So before I get into the content, just a few helpful tips. If you've never used uh, the system we're using today is called GoToWebinar, similar to Zoom, but a couple of things here that may be helpful. First of all, you have this control panel and on this control panel, you'll have a orange button that looks kind of like this one that the arrow is pointing to. And you can click that orange button to either extend your control panel out so you can see it or it'll push it back over to the side so that you can see the screen and everything that I'll be going through with you today. The reason you might want to pull it out is because if you have a question, you can then go to that question section in the control panel, click on that, and you can type your question in. And when you do that, that question will go to Ernie. He'll be able to see that as I'm presenting to you today. And then at the end, um, he'll, he'll come back and join me to handle that uh, Q&A uh, in the last 10 minutes or so of this call. And then finally, all of you are on mute right now. Uh, that is not to be rude. <laughs> it is, uh, that is on purpose, but uh, the reason why is because anytime you have a call with this many people, uh, obviously there's the, uh, you know, the chance for background noise and distractions, and we want to avoid that. So. Uh, you can hear me, we can't hear you, but if you have questions, just please use that questions feature I showed you a moment ago. Uh, very quickly, to follow up on uh, just a little bit about my background, as I already mentioned, prior to starting my existing company, mylifesite.net, I spent 13 or 14 years as a personal financial advisor, certified financial planner. 
And uh, I no longer actively practice in that industry. I always like uh, to make you aware of that because everything I'm sharing with you today, you can know is just just purely objective. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not here to try to gather any uh, investment clients or anything like that. I'm totally out of that line of work. So uh, now what we do at mylifesite.net, my, my current company is we provide online tools, resources, um, to, to help people navigate what I call complex senior living decisions. And so today I'm really kind of looking at the intersection of those two things. I'll draw on my previous experience as an advisor and also talk about where senior living fits into a, broad, uh, a broader and more comprehensive retirement plan. Uh, real quickly, uh, just a quick disclaimer here, you know, anything that I share with you related to finances uh, is not to be viewed as personal financial advice. This is, uh, again, just sort of my views on things, but you need to talk with your own advisor, tax professional, and so forth before making any decisions about your situation. So what am I going to cover with you today? Uh, number one, what are the keys to financial confidence, or maybe you'll say financial security in any environment? I think it's particularly important now with all the uncertainty that we have around us, but really at any time, what do we need to be focused on? What should be included in a comprehensive retirement plan? I think sometimes retirement plans, uh, we take a little more of a narrow focus uh, and miss some, some important aspects of that. Is it a good time to sell a home or to move? Uh, a lot of different, I know, um, discussions around this right now. And so I'll give you some perspectives that hopefully can help you as you're considering that potentially. How can you be sure you're making the right senior living decision? You know, we'll talk about some of the things you need to really think about in that decision process. And then finally, is senior living still safe? Is it still a viable option? This is something that we hear from time to time as well. So I'll uh, share a little bit of information with you there. So the quote that you see now is one of my favorite quotes, it comes from Mike Tyson, who once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched. And I think this is so true. You know, we have the best laid plans and then something unexpected happens. And, you know, it can kind of throw everything out of whack or we start to question our plan and wonder if we should abort. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this is applicable to a lot of things in life, but certainly right now, as I said, with all the uncertainty around us. So how do we really stay focused? How do we stay grounded? Or I guess with this uh, sort of quote or this analogy, how do, we, how do we stay on our feet during times like this? So I mentioned there's three things that I think are really important. And those are perspective, objectives, and then plan. If any of these three are missing, it becomes very difficult to maintain financial confidence. And so what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time going through each of these individually. So let's begin with perspective. These next couple of slides, or these next three slides, I think, I wanna talk a little bit about what we've experienced in the stock market over the last few months. Um, this is not an investment presentation by any means, but obviously, you know, your retirement accounts, your investments, your finance, that, that all ties into your planning. And so I wanna spend a few moments on that now, the interesting thing is that back in February or March, I had a lot of people that were saying to me when I was doing presentations like this, you know, uh, they were hearing a lot about how people were just so uh, kind of worried about the markets and, and their accounts and, you know, where what's going to happen. And, you know, we are such emotional people um, as human beings. We just we, we tend to let our emotions drive so much of what we do. And and what I've observed is that now all of a sudden people aren't as worried about that you know, because things have recovered so much and it's only been a few months but i still think it's helpful to spend a little time on this because i don't know what's going to happen next in the stock market nobody does by the way no matter what they tell you um, but i think it's helpful understanding that the market could go in any direction at any time and so perspective is always important so first let's just look at what's happened over the last year this is just a broad look uh, at the market in the United States. Now, I realize there are in overseas markets and, and bond markets and things like that. So this is just a broad view of what's happened in the United States over the past year. 
A couple of things I'll point out. Number one, before coronavirus, as you can see right here, um, the market was just kind of on a steady climb. It sort of felt like the market was just going to go up indefinitely. And then, of course, unexpectedly, um, you know, as I said, the coronavirus just sort of came out of nowhere. It felt like we'd been punched um, and it threw everything, you know, uh, for, for a loop. And so we've had a very steep dive here in the market and then a really impressive, uh, maybe even surprising recovery since then to where we now, as of yesterday, have actually surpassed this previous mark. But this point right here represented the all time high, at least up until yesterday, the all time high in the stock market. Uh, you know, we had experienced a 10 year bull run that I'll show you in a minute, which is extremely impressive. And, um, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, that, that's not something we've had. Every 10 year period does not look like the last 10. So we had this really nice recovery. Stimulus certainly helped in terms of the stock market. The stimulus has helped. Uh, low interest rates continue to drive the stock market uh, momentum in many ways. Um, so, you know, there's a number of things that I think have caused this. As I said, where will it go next? We don't know. But the, the thing that I think is really important when we talk about perspective is that if you look at it, depending on what headline you read, you know, some things will say, hey, we finally back, we're finally back to where we were, finally back to even, you know, but the reality is this was the all time high in the stock market. If you were to go back a year, you know, even way down here, we would have still been even, you know, uh, looking at a year. So it's all about whether we're focusing on where we were relative to the high point or where we were over the last 12 months. The reality is over the last 12 months, the market's actually up 15, almost 20 percent. I'm sorry, almost 16 percent, I should say. So, yes, we've almost back to even relative to the high point. But over the last 12 months, the market's up almost 16 percent. It's all about perspective. Now let's look at what's happened over the last 10 years. Now, this is fascinating. Look at this. What we've experienced over the last 10 years is a 208 percent increase in the stock market. That's pretty phenomenal. Longest bull run in the history of the stock market. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice that even in 2018, just a couple of years ago, the market was down further than what we've experienced more recently. But this didn't get near as much attention. Obviously, we didn't have the, the forced economic shutdown and all the societal and the, the health effects and everything that's going on. But all of this just helps me to gain a little perspective, helps me to kind of take a breather, to know that even if the market were to come back down again, it helps me to have a little bit of a mental cushion. And that leads me to the next thing, is that when you look at the market right now, there's a number of ways to sort of measure whether the market is um, overpriced or underpriced or fairly priced. One of the ways of doing that is to look at the average P.E. ratio of stocks on the S&P 500. Now, the P, a P.E. ratio, most of you probably know what that is, but if you don't, it's just the, the price of a stock relative to the earnings of that company. And so essentially, if we look at the, the, the average P.E. ratio across all 500 stocks on that index, we can begin to get a sense of whether the market is perhaps overpriced or not. Um, and if you look at that right now, the market is, uh, the, the average is at 31. The historical median on an inflation adjusted basis is just under 16. So we're nearly double what the, that of the historical median in terms of that average PE ratio. Now, what am I saying? Why am I sharing this with you? What are you supposed to do with this information? Well, obviously that's up to you and your advisor. But in reality, if the market were to kind of get back on the historical trend line, it would need to come back down some. Uh, we don't want to see that happen. Nobody wants to see their account values go down. You know, we'd love to see our markets go up indefinitely, but that's not always good either because the bubble just grows and grows. So I think it's just, again, whether we continue on this V shape or whether we go more to a W. You know, I think it's helpful to kind of know where we've been and that this market's at a really high point, even with all we've experienced. 
And so you and your advisor can talk about obviously how you want to be positioned in this type of an environment. But I think for the sake of perspective, that's something important for us to all realize. Now I want to talk a little bit about the housing market as well. Some of you on this call may be trying to figure out if this is a good time to sell your home or not. You know, you're in conversation with Ernie and the team at uh, University Oaks and you're trying to figure out, or I'm sorry, University Village, and you're trying to figure out, you know, maybe uh, should I wait and what have you? Well, a couple of things. Number one, we've seen some really close, you know, there's a strong sort of uh, a parallel sort of path that we've seen with housing prices and stock market over the last 10 years. Just as I showed you a moment ago, this top line, and by the way, don't pay too much attention to the numbers. This is a national average. I realize home prices in California uh, overall are substantially higher than this national average. But nonetheless, I think it's indicative of what we've all experienced in terms of the housing market. And this top line takes inflation out of it. So uh, it's inflation adjusted. And you can still see this increase that we've had over the last, this is 65 plus years. Here's the last 10 years here at the end. And this has not slowed down. Housing prices are still climbing in most parts of the country, believe it or not. So I'm sharing this with you because kind of like what I said a moment ago, we would all love to know that our homes are just gonna continue to go up in value, but the reality is that's probably not gonna happen indefinitely. So we just need to recognize where we've been. But as I said, so far, things are still holding up very well in the housing market. So that leads to this question again, do we sell, do we wait? Uh, well, obviously I can't answer that for you and I'm not a realtor either way. So you need to talk with a knowledgeable and experienced realtor that knows your market very well. But just a few things I'll share with you. Home inventories are still very tight, as I'm sure you've probably read in many, many areas of this country, most areas of this country. And what's happened, and by the way, I saw an article uh, just this week, actually, that said in California, buyers are down, there's 50% fewer buyers in the market right now than there was, I think it was a year ago. But there's 45% fewer sellers in the market right now. So think about that for a moment. What basically has happened is inventories were, were very tight to begin with before all of this happened. And that hasn't changed because the equilibrium is still about the same. There's fewer buyers to be sure because of the economy, but there's also fewer sellers because people have decided either not to list their home or to even delist their home. And so that's kept things very tight. Home sales volumes are down, not as many homes are being sold, but prices are still up overall. And I think I just read in that same article, in fact, I believe it said that home prices are projected to continue going up in August and September. So one could say I'm gonna keep waiting because the home prices are continuing to go up. But kind of like the stock market, we don't know how soon or when that would change. So something to think about, Obviously, low mortgage rates are helping right now. Uh, record low mortgage rates. In low interest rates are not the greatest for savers who want to have just money in the bank or CDs, but obviously for mortgage holders, mortgage uh, those taking out a mortgage, it's a really big deal. That's helping a lot. Every 1% that mortgage rates go up, purchasing power goes down by about 10%. And so people don't wanna miss out on this historical opportunity in terms of their purchasing power that they can get with these rates. But mortgage rates are pretty, you know, they can be pretty unpredictable. I, I anticipate that will stay low for a while, but you just don't ever really know. Um, particularly in an environment like this, uh, you just don't really know. So certainly um, that's helped. But here's another thing to think about. Remember I talked about those that have delisted their homes or have waited to sell and how that's kind of kept things tight in terms of inventory? Well, I was talking to a realtor who mentioned this to me. He said, you know, if, if those that have delisted all come back around the same time, and if those who, have, who ultimately have to sell their home, maybe they were able to hold out for a while, 
they've lost their jobs or whatever, you know, had to close their business, whatever it may be, and they were able to hold out. But at some point they can't hold out and they have to sell their home. If all those things kind of happen at the same time, and certainly if mortgage rates were to creep up a little bit along with those things, that could change things very quickly. Uh, so that could drive up inventories uh, pretty rapidly. Do I know that's gonna happen? Do I know when that's gonna happen, if it even does happen? No, certainly not. But I think those are things worth considering when you weigh all of this out. Bottom line is right now, it's still a seller's market, all time high housing prices in many areas of the country, even though there was a little bit of a dip there earlier this year. Finally, I would say, just know what you're waiting for. If you say, I'm gonna wait, you'd, I, I think you just need to have very clear parameters that you're willing to work within, because if you don't, if you don't have that clearly defined, then you could just end up waiting indefinitely or, or perhaps even waiting until it's more difficult to achieve your objective. So I think you need to be very specific about what it is you're waiting for and kind of put that stake in the ground. So that leads to the next thing. Remember I said perspective, objective, and plan. So this is a, that kind of leads to the next piece, which is objectives. Now, when, we, when it comes to retirement planning, you hear a lot about objectives, or you see the commercials, right, on TV, uh, your goals and your dreams, and I'm not really talking about that that kind of thing. But I think, you know, it's almost like we get too, too focused on those things and forget the basics. And we really need to have these clear objectives because you can't measure the effect of market volatility, certainly, or, you know, you, you can't measure the effect of volatility on your plan, and you really can't even have a reliable plan without very clear objectives. They don't have to be confusing and complex, but they need to be very clear. In other words, I just want to have as much money as, as I can at the end, or, you know, I just want to earn as much as I can when the market's up and, and lose little when it's down. Those aren't plans. Those are, those, those are arbitrary plans. So, you need to be able to really kind of peg what's happening in the market to your specific plan. And so what we wanna do, let's just look at some examples of, of objectives. These are, let's start with what I call primary objectives. And these can be pretty straightforward. Maybe your only primary objective is to never run out of money to live comfortably. Well, in that case, you're not so, much, you're not so worried about how much you have at the end. You just don't wanna run out <laughs> before the end. So you could uh, conceivably even draw down on some of your principal, perhaps over your lifetime, but you just always make, want to make sure you have enough cushion to never run out of money to live comfortably. Or many of you, I would say, go a step further, to never run out of money to live comfortably and to have X amount, whatever that is, to lead to my family, to charities, to both. I think it actually makes sense to assign a number to assign a goal or an objective to that. Maybe you surpass that, maybe you come in a little bit under it, but now if you have these things very clearly defined, it's so much easier to push our emotions aside because even if the market's down, whether it's down 10 or 20 or 30 or whatever it is, you can look at it and say, okay, I know what I have now, I know what I wanna have at the end, I know what I want, I need to live on. Has this situation, substantially changed my probability of being able to meet my objectives? If the answer is no, then we don't have to worry as much. We don't have to, we can kind of not let our emotions get in the way. If the answer is yes, then we can make adjustments. But if we don't have those clear objectives, we really don't know and we're just kind of floating in the wind. So that now leads to my secondary, secondary objectives. These have to be planned for under or within your primary objectives. So examples might be to not be a burden on my family. This is really important to a lot of people. Uh, you know, I wanna commend you all that are on this call because I know that you're already thinking about your future. You're already thinking about the options. And one of the reasons maybe that you're in discussions with the team at University Village is because you wanna make sure that you have a plan for yourself. You maybe wanna be sure that you don't have to rely on family later on if something were to change. Um, so that's a big deal to a lot of people. 
also to protect against the cost of long-term care. This is also another really important secondary objective that people have. And there could be others to remain independent, whatever it is. But, you know, all of these, again, have to be planned for under those primary objectives. So now let's talk about that third piece, which is a plan. All of this, you know, you have to have perspective and objective, and that leads to being able to have a reliable plan. But when we talk about retirement planning, number one, retirement planning doesn't end when somebody retires. It may take a different shape, but retirement planning is just as important throughout retirement as it was in your pre-retirement years. Just the focus is a little different. And then also retirement planning, in my opinion, doesn't stop with just your financial part. or It's, it's not just finances. There's more to it than that. And so if you look at this study or this survey that was done several years ago, I, I would imagine if they did it again, the answers would be very similar. But it asked people in retirement, what are some of your biggest concerns about living a long life? And you can see the answers here on the screen. The number one concern is serious health problems. 72%, that's not a big surprise. That's a big concern for a lot of retirees. Not being a burden on my family, second biggest concern. Followed by things, you even have things on here like being lonely or not having a purpose. Again, they don't even have, those don't have that much to do with finances, at least not directly speaking. And so if you were to really think about, you know, what is the purpose of a plan? It's to help increase your peace of mind. A solid plan gives us peace of mind. So what does peace of mind look like for you? It's probably the opposite of the things that you see here on this screen. To the extent that you can minimize these concerns in your life, that's going to increase peace of mind for you. So how do we do that? Well, let's talk then about a retirement plan and what it really should include. Number one, finances certainly is an important part of it, probably the key driver. But I want to share three other categories that are all interconnected. They all relate to one another in, in, in some way. And so the next piece is, I would call this preventative health or maybe lifestyle or wellness. Remember two of the concerns on that slide a moment ago, loneliness, not having a purpose, social isolation, those kind of things. These are social wellness components. There's other aspects of wellness, intellectual, vocational, emotional, spiritual, certainly physical. So, you know, really tapping into all those aspects of wellness today certainly is good for your well-being now and your health now but also for the future in, in theory the more you're doing those things today the less you'll have to spend on medical bills later on now that may not always be true i realize that there can be outliers and different things but in general the healthier you're living today that should reduce that concern health major health care concerns and, and and the cost of those concerns later on Nonetheless, we do know that things can happen. Sometimes health changed gradually. Sometimes people live healthy right up until the very end. For others, health can change suddenly, unexpectedly, and it can turn your world upside down and sometimes that of your family. And a lot of times that's because there's not a solid plan in place. So that leads to this third one, which I call your post health event plan. What is the plan if your health were to change, particularly if it changed suddenly, whether it's, a, a, you know, a stroke or a heart attack or a fall or some other health um, issue that arises? You know, what's the plan? That's very important. Again, this is a for many people. This is why perhaps a community like University Village makes sense, because you want to have that plan in place. You want to be somewhere where if your condition changes, they have the different services healthcare services and so forth that you need and want to have at your disposal so that you don't have to be a burden on your family. That leads to the next one, which of course is family. You know, that was the second biggest concern on that previous slide. So having those important discussions with your family, uh, maybe estate planning would fit in this category as well. You know, whether you wanna have money left over for your family, that was one of the concerns on that slide. 
Um, you know, and, and even if your family does have to be involved at some point in the future, the financial burden can extend to that family member in many cases, not always, but uh, more than people realize where they have to take time out, out off their, from their own careers or what have you. So all of these things, as I said, are kind of interrelated in different ways, interconnected in different ways. And they all come back to finances in the end. But here's another important point that I think people don't realize is that where you live throughout your retirement years is a very important part of this retirement plan. Where you live plays a key role in all of these categories. When you think about it, preventative health or lifestyle, where you live, the community around you, the environment plays a big deal, a big role in that. You know, the extent to which your family would need to be involved if something were to change. Where you're living in that moment plays a big role in that. Uh, your post-health event plan, if your health changed suddenly and unexpectedly, where you're living plays a big role in the plan that you would have in place there. So all of these things, you know, housing is a very important part of it. So that leads me to wanting to talk a little bit about the options. You know, those of you on this call, I'm assuming it's because you've at least considered the fact that your own home is not going to be the the most uh, the, the best or the healthiest option for you long term. And so you're exploring your options. In doing that, you know, it's not always that easy. It, it can be a little complex trying to figure out all the different categories of senior living and all the different trade-offs. So I want to spend a little bit of time on that in the hopes that this can be helpful. Anytime you're comparing or analyzing different communities, different retirement communities, it's really important to think about the trade-offs because if you don't understand the trade-offs, it's really tough to do an apples to apples comparison. So the first of the four main areas of trade-offs is the cost today. This is probably the most obvious one. You know, what's it cost to live there? That's gonna include a monthly cost and in many cases, perhaps an entry fee. Now that entry fee may re be refundable to a large degree, but at any rate, what's that cost to live there today? The second part is the level of hospitality type services and amenities that are available within that community. Clearly there's gonna be a trade off between these two. The reality is some communities simply provide more in the way of these types of services and amenities than others. And some people may want more in the way of hospitality type services and amenities than others. So understanding you know, what you really wanna have available, what, uh, you know, what it's worth to you to have those things available and so on, so forth. But you can't really compare the cost of two or three or more communities if you don't understand what you're getting for that cost. And, and that's not always clear, you know, what's included and what's not, what's additional cost and, and so forth. So you need to recognize what's available, the cost and all, all those kind of things. But that leads also to down the road. You don't want to think just about today because, as I said, your health could change, whether it's gradually or suddenly. Some retirement communities provide very little in the way of care. Some provide a little bit. Maybe they provide you know, assisted living in your, uh, you know, your apartment or your home or whatever it is. Uh, maybe they provide some memory care, um, but they don't necessarily provide those higher levels of more advanced type of care. And then others, like University Village, provides a full continuum. Everything from totally independent residents to 24-hour care and everything in between. So, so you have, you know, different communities um, sort of sort of go out a different a different uh, part of that scale in terms of how much care they make available. So thinking about, you know, um, what do you want to have available later on if something changed? Would you want to have to move again, you know, or possibly a, a second time after that? You know, my, my great aunt was in a rental retirement community that only provided, uh, you know, assisted living type care. And my mother got a call and said that she was not going to be able to stay there any longer because she just needed a higher level of care than they could provide. And at that point, you know, a very stressful situation, kind of back to square one. Where do we go now? What are the options? Who has availability? All of those kind of things. And then finally, 
whatever care is available within that community, what's the cost of that care? This is really important to understand because the reality is you'll different communities charge a different rate for care that you may need. So you can't really just think about what's the cost today. You really have to think of it in terms of your lifetime cost. And so with that in mind, I want to give you just some examples of how pricing can work at different communities. Now, this is just conceptual. Uh, you need to obviously gather your own information on specific communities and so forth. But conceptually, there's a few different models. And this is why understanding the lifetime cost is important. The first and really one of the most popular options is represented by what I'm showing you here. And it's called a life care contract. Okay, and this is what's offered at University Village, perhaps others in your area, I'm not, I'm not sure, but life care works this way. You move into the community and you're gonna pay your, and of course you're gonna pay, an, and many times these first three I'm gonna show you require an entry fee, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But after paying your entry fee, whatever that is, you'll pay your monthly fee, which can vary depending on the size of that residence and maybe some other things. But if you ever need, say, assisted living or nursing care or any of these other types of long-term care services, you continue paying the same thing. Your monthly cost doesn't change. Now, that's not to say there can't be inflationary increases along the way. That's true of any retirement community. But you're not going to have a big jump in your monthly cost when you start to receive care. So for people that like predictability, for people who like to know what they're gonna pay, no matter how long they need care or how much care they need, then life care is a really good model because it gives you that predictability. You really sort of know what your, what are your out of pocket cost exposure, you, you sort of know where that's capped. So that's really good from the standpoint of predictability. Now, some communities work more like this. You'll pay an entry fee, but, you'll pay less while living independently. How much less, that can vary. And here's something that's important. These examples I'm showing you, let's assume that all other things are equal. Let's assume that, let's say one retirement community was gonna give you all of these options. This is probably how it would work. But as I said a moment ago, you have trade-offs. So sometimes, you know, all other things are not always equal. But if they were, in theory, this is kind of how it looks. So some communities you'll pay less while living independently, but if you need care, you'll pay the full cost of that care, which can be exorbitant. And you don't know how long you'll need that care. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad option. Some people prefer to kind of roll the dice and say, well, I'll only pay for it if I need it, but you don't know how much of it you'll need or how long you'll need it. So there's you know trade-offs again, but this is where thinking about the lifetime cost is important. You have others that are kind of a blend, maybe a hybrid of those two in some ways. And then finally, there are a number of rental communities out there where there's not, you know, maybe there's not an entry fee. But here's something I always tell people they need to understand, and this goes back to understanding lifetime cost. All other things being equal, the rental community has to charge a higher monthly rate, even while you're, when you're living independently because they're not getting anything on the front end to offset that monthly cost. So they're collecting it as they go. So that's gonna have to be a higher cost while you're living independently. And so with a rental community, even though there's not an entry fee, many times you're gonna pay more across the board. You know, you're gonna pay more when you're living independently and then you're gonna pay the full cost when you need care. So depending on how long you live and how much care you need, it's conceivable you could pay just as much that way. So you just need to understand all of these trade-offs. And furthermore, remember, sometimes with these rental communities, this highest level of care may not even be available. So you have to think about the cost of just of moving again and those kind of things. I am not promoting one model over another. I'm just trying to give you as objective of a view as I can and point out some of the things that people don't often realize when they're comparing their options. So now what I want to do is talk a little bit about, um, you know, obviously coronavirus, uh, the impact on senior living. This is a, something that's on, I'm sure, your minds and the minds of many right now. And how does this impact things? So I'm not a medical director. 
I'm not a, a healthcare administrator, so I can't talk on a really uh, you know, granular medical level about this, but I do talk with a lot of residents of different communities who, you know, folks that follow our blog or our newsletter and they'll, they'll, they'll write back to us and things. Um, you know, I talk with a lot of prospective residents like yourself. And even I talk with the staff at many communities across the country. So what I'm just going to share with you is kind of, you know, some of my observations and things that I think are important to consider right now. First, I think when we talk about coronavirus and retirement communities or senior living or whatever we want to call it, I think we have to separate what I call care settings, i.e. assisted living, nursing care, those types of settings from independent living. Let's talk about those two separately because we know that the biggest impact of coronavirus, COVID-19, has been felt in, in what I would refer to as standalone nursing homes. And when I say standalone, what I mean is they're not a part of a broader organization, or no, that's not, they're not a part of a community that offers the full spectrum, like University Village, where you have independent living and, and all the different aspects. They're just, they just offer nursing care. So that's what I'm refer that's what I mean when I say standalone. That's where the biggest, you know, all these big outbreaks that we've seen and read about on the news have been in these standalone. Now, that's not to say there haven't been outbreaks in, you know, these more of a full service type communities where you have independent living. There have been some, don't get me wrong, but many of them, the majority have been in these standalone nursing homes, some of which, unfortunately, were not very well run to begin with. Not always, but many times. Maybe they had low ratings there and those kind of things. Um, so that's where, you know, we've seen the biggest effects. And sometimes that was because, you know, maybe they just didn't have the right protocols in place or they didn't act early enough and decisively enough. And, you know, so because of that, things kind of got out of control early on. But I will say this, even for those facilities, communities, um, even when they did take the right steps or try to do the right things, it's still been a very tough situation, a very it's a big challenge because obviously dealing with asymptomatic spread, uh, a virus that still, you know, there's little known about it. Um, and the fact that there's still a lack of resources. So many communities have had a hard time getting, uh, I've read some things here in our paper in North Carolina where different long-term care providers are still trying to get the resources, the protective equipment and the testing that they need. So they've been shorthanded even when they've wanted and tried to do the right things. And so, you know, you hear about all these outbreaks um, on TV, you tend to always hear about the worst things. The reality is most, the majority of providers have done a really good job with this. And um, life plan or life care communities like University Village overall have done exceptionally well. Again, that's not to say they haven't had cases, but they've done exceptionally well overall of, of really managing this. And so, um, you know, there's a few other things that I, that I won't get into, but I, I just think there's some real positive stories that we don't hear about. You know, we only tend to hear about the worst things, but uh, I don't want to lessen the severity or, or make light of what's happening. Obviously, it's, it's, it's very difficult for many um, facilities and, and the families that are being served, the individuals there. But I'll say this, I'm, I'm an optimist overall. I, I always look for the silver lining and I really do believe that everything that's being learned right now by the senior living industry is only going to make things better going forward. Um, you know, I'm already seeing uh, some really uh, fascinating technology, early detection and prevention technology that's already coming out. I think we'll see design changes. Um, you won't see, again, a lot of these standalone nursing homes that I mentioned, you know, two and three people to a room type of situation. You know, that's just going to have to change. We're not going to see that. And, and many, Again, many of these larger providers like a university village that also have other levels, uh, they've already kind of been ahead of the curve with some of that. So, uh, and I think we'll continue to see protocols, you know, that'll change. So all of this I think will help going forward. But now I wanna talk a little bit about independent living because there's some things here that I think are important to recognize. When we see all the stories on the news, now, you know, it's kind of a, a wide, uh, stroke that gets that gets brushed across the whole industry, but the reality is 
those living in an independent living, meaning they're living in a community, they're, they're, not, they're not in need of care on a daily basis, so independent living residents, they have a little more flexibility. Obviously, they can get out, they can socially distant, obviously, but they can take walks around that, the, 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 um, the, the community or the campus or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, they can do different things. I've seen such creative things being done to kind of maintain the sense of community. Um, you can see these pictures that have been sent to me from a couple of different communities where residents are just showing their gratitude and, you know, just how grateful they are to be where they are. And that's what I've, that's one of the things I've observed is that early on when all this started, residents were fearful. They didn't know what it was going to mean. What are they going to do? Were they going to have to leave? But now, you know, I've noticed that that's given way pretty rapidly to a sense of gratitude that, hey, we're actually, we actually feel safe here. You know, we actually feel pretty good where we are. Now, that doesn't mean it's ideal. And everybody has different views on how to handle this. We know that. And so some residents maybe don't want as many restrictions. Most, from what I've observed, are grateful because they know they're being taken care of. And it, it requires some sacrifice. But as I've been telling people, you know, it requires sacrifice from all of us, not just community. My parents live at home still. They haven't had any visitors, um, you know, and they're having to go to the grocery store and things that they feel uncomfortable doing. Whereas residents of retirement communities, they haven't had to go to the grocery store. You know, that's one of the things I've heard is we love the fact that our groceries are delivered, things are taken care of. So there's actually a lot of good out there right now that I think many residents would tell you, but we just don't hear that a lot. Um, the sense of community is important. Uh, again, if you look at these pictures, what it conveys is a sense of community. And for some people, that's very important. Now, again, they can't be as near to one another. They have to socially distant and all those things. But being a part of something, knowing they're getting through this as a community, emotionally and psychologically for some people is really important. Um, you know, familiar faces that they're sort of in it with each day. So that sense of community is still valuable and very strong in many communities and, and all the things that they're doing to maintain that sense of community. The different types of you know, activities and parades and all the things they've been doing to maintain that sense of community, to me has been inspiring um, and it's been very impressive. This uh, is a quote that I found that I loved. It was from an article in the Dallas Morning News and I think it, you know, I think it really reflects what I'm talking about. They interviewed this resident and he said, you know, the residents here feel far from trapped. They're grateful. If there's a good place to be at a time like this, it's here. People share the good times and the bad, so we'll make it through this. So everything I kind of talked about, the gratitude, feeling safe, actually being where they are, because everything's kind of taken care of for them. And, you know, getting through it together as a community. So. I'm not suggesting that there's one size fits all. I realize all of you have to make your own decisions on what's best for you and your future, but I do know this is a sentiment that I've heard over these last few months from many, many residents. So I think that's important to keep in mind. And then lastly, this question of, you know, is senior living still viable? Is it still safe? Will people still do it? Well, I think for many of the reasons I've just mentioned, the answer is yes. But for me, here's the thing. For anybody that says, I want to stay home, I'm going to stay home as long as I can, um, I always say that probably requires as much planning, if not more planning, than anything else. Because the challenge from a planning perspective of staying in your own home is just a lot of the unknowns. Um, you don't necessarily know what types of things could change and, you know, what type of expenses there could be. If you're with your home or you know unexpected things that could pop up or with your health and whether you need 24 hour care and what involvement your family you know and what the cost will be for that there you know whether you need home modifications based on whatever your health condition may be there's just so many things that are that are a little more difficult to plan for whereas in a retirement community you know you know your your monthly cost and you know what that includes you know what services are available you know what care is available if you ever need it. You know you have a plan in place. So it just it, it just removes some of the um, some of the unknowns. It adds a little more predictability. Don't, I'm not saying it's the perfect thing for everybody, but that to me is one of the challenges of staying in your own home. And and I think right now with everything we're facing, all of those unknowns are just magnified. 
you know, they're magnified in different ways because of, you know, having to stay distant from people and, and just all the different aspects of that, the turnover in the caregiving industry. And if you ever needed that, you know, the turnover and managing that, somebody's got to manage all of that. So there's just a lot of complexity and a lot of unknowns um, to that situation. And it, it can work out fine for some, but for others, it can be, um, it can be pretty challenging. So, uh, but I absolutely do think that there will still be a, a viable, I, I think, uh, I think senior living communities like University Village will certainly be a viable option uh, for some people for a long time to come. So in summary, before we go to the Q&A, um, keep perspective. I talked with you a little bit early on in the presentation about how perspective is so important because if without perspective, our, our emotions can get in the way. And we also need very clear objectives because you can't have a plan without clear objectives. And you really don't know if the market, has, if there's volatility, you know, you don't know what that really means to you if you don't have clear objectives. Uh, remember that retirement planning is more than just finances and that where you live, housing is a very important part of that plan. What you are learning, I'm sorry, what the industry is learning right now, I think is only going to help going forward. So I think, you know, a lot of positives will come out of this as difficult as, as it is right now. And I think the challenges of aging in place, as I mentioned a moment ago, are magnified. Um, there's challenges of, of, of living in, you know, of receiving care in, in a facility setting right now too, don't get me wrong, but there's just a lot of things you need to consider on both sides of the equation when you're weighing out your options. So anyway, um, I, I hope that something I've shared with you today can be helpful as you go forward in your planning. So I thank you all again. And I want to call Ernie back on and uh, we can take any questions that we've received. Ernie, are you, are you there? You might need to come off. Uh, yes, oh, it appears I am. All right. That was excellent. That was excellent, Brad. Uh, I you. hope my uh, crew back uh, at UVTO you know, tuned in as well, because I think there's some excellent points um, that they can communicate one-on-one um, -on -one with many of our, many of our clients. Uh, we did get some questions. Um, first off, uh, we did get a comment from uh, one of our viewers who indicated that buyers have flooded the market. Uh, inventory is low, and this is the seller's market. Sellers are now starting to come back into the market. Um, this is uh, a, a good time to sell. Uh, and so that's one comment at, uh, that came from one person. I'm not gonna mention the names because I'm not sure um, they actually want their names aired uh, during this presentation. Another one said, and, and you can help me with this, Brad, uh, says presentation is excellent. My wife could not make it today. Any way to get a copy of the materials from Brad's presentation? I am going to make a, a video, even better, you're gonna get a, um, a recording that I'll share with Ernie and he can get that to you. So you, you'll have a full recording of everything I went through with you today and you can share that uh, with your spouse or anybody else. Okay, good. Uh, so we'll we'll probably just put that on our uh, website, um, uvto.com, and uh, people can access it there. Uh, so super, thank you very much for that. And this question, maybe we could both tackle, uh, does care include any and all possible medical procedures, heart surgery, transplants, hip, or these additional charges? And so uh, let me just uh, dive in here and you know, we are a continuing care retirement community or life plan community. And so we have a long-term care uh, center where we're providing access to assisted living, uh, memory care, and nursing care on a long-term basis. And so uh, the people that move to University Village are still gonna maintain their relationships with all of their physicians, you know, the physician work groups, the hospitals, et cetera. You know, and that's where, of course, you know, the experts you know, that deal with hips and knees, uh, hearts, et cetera, will continue to serve our clients. Uh, and so, you know, if someone does go to the hospital, has uh, some type of um, procedure that requires uh, a short term stay in uh, skilled nursing, you know, that's made available to them. Um, but through their Medicare and perhaps supplemental insurance. 
But if anybody then needs it for a long-term basis, say for the rest of their life, then that's where they would reside um, in our, in our long-term care center. So thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, Brad, did you have any comments on that? No, I think you've answered that uh, adequately. So no, nothing to add there. Okay, um, wow, this is a great uh, question. Um, will costs at UVTO go up exponentially with the COVID pandemic? We have to factor in monthly expenses as well as move-in costs. And, um, you know, it's true, every year, January 1st, uh, we will have a monthly service fee uh, increase. Uh, most likely we'll, we'll see an increase in our um, entrance fees as well. Um, you know, traditionally every increase that we have in the monthly service fee uh, tends to be uh, determined by, you know, the cost of running our community. So uh, conceivably, um, you know, the, all the different actions that we've taken to keep our residents safe and keep our residents engaged, um, you know, at a very high level, you know, perhaps that could be factored into uh, any increase. But, um, you know, we're just now starting that process uh, at UVTO, uh, the budget process for 2021. And so more to come uh, on that on that score. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, our goal is to maintain uh, lower monthly service fee increases. And then if you look over the, the last 20 some odd years of um, our enterprise and the various communities that we've built, you know that that increase um, have has averaged uh, less than four percent. So uh, we're very proud of that. You know, given all the different changes um, that have gone on with the um, minimum wage in the state of California, uh, that, that that story is still to play out. Uh, more more to come on that, but uh, that that's probably one of the uh, driving forces uh, th that by by itself is one of the biggest driving forces uh, as we uh, del deliberate with regards to the monthly uh, service fee increase good question um, what is the capacity of your long-term care or memory care portions is the average age of your population getting older well um, the 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 capacity, um, well, let me just first start out by, by indicating that when we built the long-term care center at University Village, we built it to scale. You know, a lot of research uh, has gone on with regards to long-term care uh, communities. You know, the number of people that you have in residential living, you know, which is uh, independent living, uh, there's, there's a, a you know, there, there's research to determine how many of those folks uh, at any given time are gonna be using the long-term care center. So I think we, we uh, scored a home run on that. Um, it's, it is uh, scaled uh, appropriately. And so we do have capacity um, for our residents who may need uh, skilled nursing or assisted living memory care. And so, um, you know, if you uh, visit uh, virtually, uh, we'd be glad to answer more questions on that score, but we're very comfortable with the relationship between residential living and uh, of course, uh, the long-term care center. Uh, what are common red flags assessing the actuarial health of a type A community? Uh, that's, that's a great question too. Brad, I'm gonna turn that one over to you. Yeah, sure, well, I don't know that, um... I don't know that I can speak to red, red flags as much, but I can tell you that if it's a type A community, and by the way, those of you on the call that may not know exactly what that means, type A, we're really talking about life care. Remember when I showed you that chart and I said that one of the more popular models is where your monthly rate basically stays the same for life, no matter what level you're in? That's life care, and obviously that does require some actuarial projections because part of that entry fee, part of those monthly fees even, the, that community needs to be um, setting some of that aside to help offset the resident population's care needs. It works very much like a long-term care policy. Um, uh, so, you know, in that regard, conceptually anyway, um, so in that regard, there is some component of actuarial analysis that no, needs to go in that. So I would, 
I would say the first question is, you know, um, do, do you get, do you have regular actuarial assessments done and provided for your community, you know, and uh, ask, you know, for the community to share a little bit with you about that. And, and if that's how pricing is sort of based on those actuarial projections and those kind of things is, so you just want to make sure all that's being done um, and that they have the reserves set aside. And this is what actuar an actuarial study will tell you, if you have the right uh, reserves set aside to meet those future obligations. So I'm, I'm sure Ernie may have something to add to that. Uh, excellent. You know, we're at the 12 o'clock hour. And so I just wanted to, you know, actually close as in, you know, being sensitive to time. Um, just know the, 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 those questions and many more can be answered um, by me or um, our residency counselors at University Village. You could just uh, dial us at 805-241-3300 and be glad to answer those. But let me just close with one important piece. And that is, obviously in March, um, we broadly were you know, hit with a, uh, a sledgehammer with regards to COVID. It changed pretty much everything in our lives. And of course, we were affected as well at University Village. Our, our very first priority was to keep our residents safe. And so, yes, just recommending uh, recommendations by CDC and the uh, County of Ventura, you know, we had to react to that uh, in order to uh, keep our good standing and, and to keep our residents uh, safe. But that doesn't, that didn't mean, that didn't mean that we had to in, in, end engagement. That piece is so important to our communities. It's the reason why when we get on the phone to talk with someone who's in their house, who's not going anywhere, we can describe to them you know, some of the things that are going on here. For instance, we, according to recommendations, we had to go outside with our dining uh, apparatus. Well, obviously what we had to do was buy these huge tents and keep certain sides of those tents open. We built it all alongside of our pond. And so now we have these beautiful outdoor dining uh, uh, areas for our residents to enjoy. Um, in fact, we asked the residents to please name this new restaurant. And they came up with the koi and turtle. And so there's koi and turtle in the pond. They're not on the menu, at least that's what I'm told. So anyway, uh, good job on, on the naming of that, of that restaurant. We also have outdoor fitness circuit that, that's, uh, that's managed by our, our um, excellent uh, fitness team. And so people can go through that circuit under supervision. And so uh, people are just setting up appointments in order to do that. Uh, same with the swimming pool, um, that's going on as well. Uh, so people are actively swimming laps. And so that's on a schedule. And of course, we're broadening the number of people allowed in the pool. You know, Each week there are new recommendations by CDC and the County of Ventura. And so we're, of course, we're working through that process with them. We have, um, thankfully, an outdoor salon. So, you know, residents can can uh, start, um, the guys can start uh, getting those, you know, locks uh, uh, trimmed back and uh, women are able to get their hair uh, colored and, and uh, coiffed. And so all of that is just, is just good news. On our website, you'll be able to see uh, our calendar of activities. So go to uvto.com, you'll see uh, all of uh, September, I think, no, uh, August still uh, is there and September will soon be there. And so you'll be able to see all the different engagement pieces that um, are coming together. Um, we absolutely feel a community like this is far better than just remaining in your home. And now you have this perfect opportunity you know, it seems like a lot of stars are aligned with the stock, with the stock market, you know, the housing market, et cetera. And, um, you know, although we have a wait list and we can talk to you about that, um, there is opportunity. We have some one bedroom apartments that are coming back onto the inventory. And so uh, some, someone who's um, biting at the bit to, to move into our community might do so actually uh, fairly rapidly. So all good news. Um, Brad, thanks again 
for uh, all your help with this. It's it's always a pleasure to listen in. I, I always take information uh, back to the farm. Uh, yeah. Brad yeah. just has done this presentation on our campus uh, two times already, and so this has been an interesting experience. But yeah. I really appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, Brad, best wishes to you and yours. And um, I think we're going to bring this to a close. So thank right. you very much. Sounds great. Thank you all. Thanks, Ernie. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye.